good evening. Uh, yeah, let's see. Um, I'm glad you're enjoying my videos and I thought I'm gonna make another video and I'm gonna talk a little bit about my background and how I actually fit into this whole car thing. Uh, my background is such that I'm a hardware engineer. I design circuit boards, electronics, products for a wide variety of applications. The primary markets I serve is industrial control equipment. That's the biggest one. Then military control stuff for a variety of uh, different things that ranged from missile guidance systems for McDonnell Douglas Boeing to the auto start systems we're offering for military generators and a few other things. Uh, I came over here to the United States uh, first in 1989 and then in permanently in 1991 uh, because the U.S. military uh, needed my expertise in certain areas. And uh, the other one is then uh, the automotive market, but I haven't really been active in that field for quite a few years. And if you have watched my videos, this video is about the development of the Jetronic. And why am I qualified to talk about this? You may ask, and I can explain this to you. I was born and raised over in Germany, and I went to school there. And I grew up in a town west of Stuttgart very close by and about in the next town over which is about three four miles maybe two miles an hour distance is the world headquarters of Bosch and the other town two miles two and a half miles over in the other direction is the R&D headquarters of Bosch and when I was in high school, I was basically, uh, or not even high school yet, that was a grammar school, in, in first, second, and third, fourth grade, my classmates, their fathers, they worked there. So I got exposed very early on to, the, to that environment and the people <clears throat> behind the development of those. We're going now back into the early 1970s. And one of my friends in particular, uh, we were together in a class uh, grade one to four. Um, he had a HO scale train and I had one. And so I would go to his house. And whenever I went to his house, uh, it was usually in the afternoon after homework, my uh, his mother would sit in the kitchen and she would solder circuit boards, many of them. She had a box there with all the resistors, capacitors, transistors, and she had a solder station there and she would uh, put those things on the board and solder the stuff in the kitchen. This is back then we weren't, no one was really worried about the health impacts and God, what this is going to do or not. That was a way to make money because this entire electronic stuff was just developing and her husband my friend's father he was the lead engineer uh, the brain behind the jetronic that's the reality of it and uh, later on he had gotten a job at Bosch in uh, I would say that must have been in the early, late 50s, early 60s, when he graduated from college. And he went in and uh, got involved with fuel injection systems and all of this stuff. And because it is a small community where I grew up, is they hired or tended to hire people they knew. So one knew the other one. So with this, I had basically uh, a foot already into Bosch. Another friend of mine worked for, his, his dad worked for a company called SEL in Stuttgart Sofnausen, which is about four or five miles away from where I grew up, and that's right next to Porsche headquarters where Porsche is made. And uh, 
SEL stands for Standard Standard Electric Loans. And SEL was a market leader since the 1930s in telecommunications equipment. And that was the headquarter, the R&D and fabrication. They got into the 50s, in the 50s, they got into two other areas that was television and radio. So they developed circuit boards at this point for Grundig, Blaupunkt and other companies. And that was the expertise was to develop the products and then build or design the circuit boards and then build this equipment. And this back then it was all handmade. All of the housewives in that area there, they worked for these companies. They all put these circuit boards together either at home or in their facility. That was pretty much the way everyone made extra money. And that's how this whole thing basically started. And SEL offered engineering services, particularly in electronics design. That was the expertise. And they had developed, like IBM, a analog computer in the 1950s. So they were on the forefront uh, with analog computing. And um, my friend's father from Bosch, uh, one of his college friends got a job where they were in leading positions there at SEL in the R&D department. So he picked up the phone somewhere in the early 60s and he called the guy over at SEL, the other guy, and uh, they got together. Uh, we had a glass of wine, as it is custom in my area since I'm in the wine region, or beer. And they talked about this and SEL actually started to develop a lot of these jetronic circuits for Bosch. Bosch was primarily at that point is still probably today that way the mechanical aspect of it so the design of uh, the valves you know the, the injector valves the injectors uh, the fuel distributors pumps and that electromechanical stuff that was their thing in stuttgart feuerbach where their biggest uh, facility is manufacturing facility was or is uh, that's where they used to make household equipment, mixers, vacuum cleaners, I mean, uh, drills, electric drills, anything what you need at a home that was like uh, our Black & Decker to a certain extent, or Sears, you know, that, that was a household name, Bosch stuff. Most people had something from Bosch at home, a coffee maker, the coffee machine, uh, mixers, uh, the little toaster ovens, that sort of stuff. So they had the expertise. So if you familiar with the 60s Benz uh, with the Jetronic, the D-Jetronic, then you know that they have an analog computer and that was a collaboration between SEL and Bosch. And uh, I got into this whole thing because of the friend I had with my other classmate at SEL, I got first into telecommunications and I was already making circuit boards by the time I was 12 because everyone had some form of circuit board stuff going from the people I knew with. My friend Norbert had, I don't know how much shit in his house. Uh, the house was full. We went to the uh, bulk mail, uh, bulk trash days when they had bulk trash. Uh, we would then bring the old televisions over to his house to and, and take them apart and, and wash machines and all of this stuff. So we had all sorts of things going and we had mopeds when we were 12 and 10. We weren't supposed to be running them yet. Uh, we were souping them up and, and we did all of that kind of stuff. That was more my background and I needed circuit boards for my HO scale train to do the automation on it. And I had another friend of mine for my father this time, he was the head engineer, electronic engineer <coughs> for the company where my dad worked at, where he was the uh, uh, one of the senior vice presidents. And uh, I winded up making the circuit boards, etching the circuit boards in his basement because he had a plastic sink. And you, when you use ferric chloride to etch circuit boards to get the couple off, um, I think I made my first circuit board when I was 11 or 12, something like this. Uh, he 
uh, you know, he had the right thing is he can't do it in a stainless steel sink because if you get the ferric chloride on a stainless steel, it will basically dull it and it becomes black. It leaves a black stain. Chrome or, or stainless steel, it will just basically destroy it. It will just blacken it and it won't finish it. But he had a plastic sink and he had the room and, and he said no problem. And he was there, he was kind of supervising me. So, and he helped me a little bit out explaining on how to put the traces on there to cover this up, the couple. And then we warmed up the uh, ferric chloride and we etched it in there. And then I drilled it, he had a little drill press. And that's how I built my first circuit board. There was a company in Stuttgart, Alt Electronics, at the time and um, they sold components you went down there you bought your transistors your leds your resistors there you told the guy i need 15 one kilo ohm uh quarter watt uh, i need eight one microfarad capacitor 16 volts i need this that so i made up a list i went in there by train in stuttgart in the middle and then uh that's where they were located alt electronics that was the place and i got my stuff there and then I took it home. They had everything. They had the multimeters. They had surplus stuff, and I mean, you name it. And that's kind of on how that worked. And I have been doing this so before I ever even got out of high school. I, I was uh, building circuits and soldering. And I also got a Sinclair CX81 computer. And this is where this gets interesting now. So, my friend's dad, who developed the actual Jetronic, uh, well, between the two guys, the one at SEL and the one at Bosch, um, they came up with this. Their entire philosophy of the Jetronic is based on PID, which is Proportional Integral Derivative Controller. So you can either adjust either one of the three, and what that will does is it will get you to a desired set value and that set value could be changed depending on temperature speed vacuum and that sort of stuff the problem is if you have opened up one of these big um, uh, 3.5 liter 4.5 liter control units digitonic control units with the two circuit boards in it uh, what you will find in there, you probably see these big, big resistors. These are all carbon resistors. All of these red uh, resistors in there, they're all carbon resistors. And uh, the problem with carbon resistors, and then they have foil capacitors. They didn't use ceramic capacitors. They used foil capacitors, mostly from Vima, which is the biggest and most popular and highest quality uh, capacitor manufacturer. Uh, foil capacitors, they're very expensive, but they're also very good. So they, they came up with this entire philosophy. And the, the PID loops, they work. You can mathematically calculate this. Uh, and you can use a couple, three, four transistors to build this circuit. Or you could use an operational amplifier. And uh, if you have ever looked at this, there's these uh, silver boxes on that circuit board. Uh, these are actually discrete operational amplifiers because at that point, when they started to develop this, this I think that was about for the 3.5 liter engine, this was 68, 69 till 79. So, no, 68 to 79 when they used that system. And they not only did that for Mercedes Benz, but they also, you know, did that for Volkswagen and all the other companies. Uh, but then each manufacturer came with their special needs for their particular engines, which had to be incorporated into this. But when you calculate this out, you can run something. But there is the problem with analog circuits is what we call drift. And the, the drift comes from temperature. And uh, the old transistors, for instance, which they have in there. Those are the old TO8 style transistors, the silver uh, cup with the silver little head on them and the three pins. Uh, those are BC107, BC108, BC109, BC110s. Uh, in Germany, the transistors, they start with a B for bipolar. I forgot what the C was. And then the first one will give you the 
voltage, I believe, in the, uh, was it the gain? No, the C, A, B, and C, the letters in the rear, will give you the gain, the maximum. A has the lowest gain, uh, where C has a, is a high gain device of those. You can order them in three different uh, gain, um, you know, uh, settings or requirements. And the silicone, those are already silicone transistors that was the first ones. Um, they were uh, pretty, almost like temperature sensors. And they work well in at uh, room temperature, around, you know, 72 degrees, uh, 74 degrees, 20 degrees, 18 to 20 degrees Celsius. But as soon as you go to any temperature uh, difference, then they started to drift. And you have this with the diodes in there, and you have this with the foil capacitors too. Um, all of these elements are very sensitive to, to temperature change. And with that, they had a constant drift in it. I remember that when I was a little bit older, this was already then in the, in the early 80s, I talked to my friend's dad about this because I was developing, you know, like I said, I was making my own board. So I was picked their, their brains to see what they come up with and what input they could give me. So when we talked about this, the, 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 general prob uh, prob the general problems with analog circuits with the particular devices you will find in these units out of that area. And uh, so the drift is a problem and they compensate for the drift by adding additional circuits to it, which will counter affect this. That makes the tuning of these circuits very difficult. Now, I have looked at the pictures. I haven't seen one of these old uh, uh, ECUs for the, uh, you know, DigiTronic in ages. And, but with the devices we have today and the quality of the capacitors and resistors, we have through hole parts. Uh, they're unparalleled. I mean, this is just a ball from there. Um, if you were to <clears throat> replace every single resistor on those, I think there's 260 of them or something like this in there. Uh, from carbon composite, 5% five, 5 the majority had 5%. The ones with the gold band on there is 5%. The silver band is 10%. If you just go to metal film resistors, low noise metal film resistors, um, with a 1% tolerance or 0.1 ton of percent tolerance, the entire circuit is going to stabilize like there's not tomorrow. It would be interesting to see if, you know, if we ever have a chance to actually overhaul one of these units to, to actually go with that. But uh, people like those because they have the direct fuel injection. But they're very difficult to tune because if these components age, they deteriorate. And of course, you have more stability to begin with in a resistor when the tolerance is only 1%, the tolerance will increase over time. And there's so much the you know circuit can handle. The other thing is the old BC-107s, for instance, or BC-108s, whatever they had in there, they can be easily replaced with BC-23, 200 series or BC-300 series resistors, uh, transistors, uh, which we have still available today, which are a thousand times better than that old uh, metal can stuff with they got in there. Uh, you know, they were just not available. This was the best they had at the time. But if you were to do it, all you need to do is match up the gain uh, with the uh, 300 BC 300 device, you know, where your uh, HFE is, and then you can get that basically, your, your stability is gonna be there. And whether the transistor is gonna have 20 volt maximum BC, uh, CE or 50 PSCE really doesn't make a big difference um, and that sort of stuff. The quies quiescent current is the same on, on both of them, uh, on these devices. And then the operational OPLMs, you know, you can make a new circuit board and actually put a high precision analog device OPAMP in there, like an OP184, uh, uh, 284, which is a rail-to-rail -rail OP amplifier, totally temperature stable from minus 40 degrees Celsius to all the way up to 80 or 100 degrees Celsius. So it, there, there could be a, <clears throat> a lot of improvements being made to this from 
what we have available in technology. <clears throat> I got then involved, like I said before. Now, this is not with the Jetronic. This is just some uh, things I have been thinking about it. The, um, I got involved with SEL on the telephone, uh, telecommunications side and military stuff because that is another area they were working on was military. And it was then, so that connection I had at SEL that I got involved with Mercedes-Benz. So I winded up doing work for Bosch, SEL, and Mercedes-Benz in Stuttgart. I didn't do anything for Porsche. It was just, it never worked out that way. I don't know why. And uh, with the SEL contacts I had with the military, they sent me to the uh, uh, communications director of the, uh, uh, of the U.S. Army in Stuttgart at the uh, Kabenloch Kaserne. And so that's how I got involved with the military. And then they had a whole bunch of other stuff they needed to get done. This was all specialized equipment. And that had to do with uh, Stuttgart being the headquarters for the uh, European forces, the U.S. Uh, allies or the U.S. Uh, European forces. And I have been out to all of the different uh, barracks at that time in, in various different projects. And then I was finally then hauled off over here and they said, well, we, you, 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 and then you're on the boat and, and you're going over here. So now I'm here and now they don't want me to leave anymore, basically. Anyway, but then at Mercedes-Benz, I ended up doing two different things. For one, well, actually three. Uh, telecommunications for Mercedes-Benz in terms of their data structure network. That was IBM token ring uh, for the uh, assembly facility in Unterturkheim. And with the engine division, uh, R&D division was in the control with the KE Jetronic and the further development because that was when they were working on the 6 liter V12 engine. That's what I was involved in. The uh, 560, I got the KE Jetronic at that point was already a done deal. So I got involved on that end in circuit board design and hardware layout uh, things and stuff like this. So if you don't like the 600 with the electronics in it, well, blame me for it. Leave a comment and, and bitch about it. Uh, I got issues for your tissues. No, we got tissues for your issues. So that's that's the part I was involved in until I left there. But the, the bulk of this was done between 1987 to 1990, somewhere around there. And I was here for a little while in the United States on, uh, you know, during that time I worked on some projects. But this is like on how this all came about. And the other thing I did for Mercedes-Benz was with SEL was the industrial control side for their assembly lines, engine manufacturing, uh, specialized PLC equipment. They use Siemens PLCs. And uh, at that time, the Cimatic had only a limited amount of IOs and there was no real, uh, you know, networking capability of those. There were standalone units, basically. And a lot of the stuff needed specialized IOs or, and that's where I started to, my company, I know High Tech, was to integrate microcontrollers at that point. Uh, from my experience I had with the ZX81, uh, Sinclair ZX81 computer and writing software and basic back then in assembled. That was the two languages we had and uh, that was basically it. So I, I did a lot of uh, circuit board development in these areas and at the same time for the engine division down there with the engine development for the v V12 for the six cylinder, as uh, 12 cylinder. 6 liter 12 cylinder there was a uh, you know the whole engineering aspect in there was really interesting was the mass airflow sensor the heated mass airflow sensor that was a new development this hasn't hadn't been there like this and that was again was a collaboration between sel Bosch, and mercedes-benz and there was a lot of men hours involved in that part um to to uh you know, to develop this, that that worked right. Because on, on those air mass sensors, um, because they're sitting on these two little ceramic dots basically in there, the uh, temperature, it always comes back to temperature, especially with car sensors, you know, uh, 
the, the temperature changes are so dramatic when you sell a car into the uh, Middle East, they, they have 50 degrees Celsius out there. That's probably what 110 that is like the same what you got out there in Scottsdale, Arizona in the summer, you know, it's a dry heat, but then it's heat, you know, heat is heat, no matter how you look at it. And then on the other hand, this you got cars, they got to go up to Alaska and they got to run at minus 30 degrees or up in Canada. Or, you know, Scandinavia, they got cold countries where they go to and uh, they have to work. And so you have to have develop when you develop these parts for the stuff, uh, they have to work in the problem they had uh, with the mass airflow sensor with the two connecting uh, ceramic holders or how, how, how I'm best gonna how best I'm gonna describe this the um, the two ceramic or a composite ceramic I should say had to be such that they did not expand or contract and the plastic had to be the same because otherwise that sensor which sits on these two leads in there is going to be either pulled apart or pushed together besides of changing it as electrical values that's the sensor itself with temperature so these are very very complex designs and they take uh two three four years to develop something like this you're gonna have at least five to ten engineers involved you know out of the different backgrounds chemistry uh, plastics, you know, electronics, you know, and then uh, materials, uh, material engineering a lot uh, is involved in that kind of stuff. And then you eventually get these things together and then they need circuit ports for this one or they have to find a particular solution for this thing or the other thing. So if, if you're interested in these electronic parts, that is my background in it. I, you know, I work on these cars to fix them like most of my views. And I said, like, you're cheap, I'm cheap. The reason why is because you cannot find people anymore now. When I had these cars new, the 420 I had, uh, you know, at that point, I would bring them over here to the dealership to have them work on it. Uh, it is more like a hobby now and to have some, you know, something to do. And, uh, it's kind of a fun thing to do, you know, a hobby uh, to a certain extent, but I get to drive my hobby and I get to enjoy it. The ultimate goal of these videos is that if you do buy one of these vehicles and you fix them up, that you can enjoy the ride. And we're going to, to be as original, you know, as what it was when they were new. That's at least my objective in it. That's why I winded up fixing the warning system buzzer you know most people may not care they may just unplug it uh i wanted to have the authenticity of this and have it working the way i was used to the car when it was new so i would like to have the car working now 33 years later pretty much the same way it was and i drive it every day and i enjoy it like i said it's the other car i'm probably gonna buy oh by the way the Biodegradable wires on the W140 engine harness. That, that's a different story altogether for a different time. Uh, they're neither biodegradable, but there was a change and that came through the EU. And I think I mentioned that before, I wanted to throw this in. Uh, the wiring manufacturing or the PVC Anything that has to do with plastic involves oil, one way or the other, crude oil, or a form of oil. In the European Union, uh, in, in an effort to harmonize the countries, I mean, this was now slightly before the collapse of the Soviet Union, we're going back to 1987, 1988 in that range, uh, started to harmonize everything that was the electrical codes the emc directive came out the electromagnetic compatibility which took effect in 1996 then you know this is planned like five to ten years out and one of these things they did was environmental protection and uh, there was a part in the wiring harnesses which is a plasticizer 
and they said that particular, I forgot what chemical substance or compound that was, which was mixed in with the uh, plastic pellets uh, during the, the extrusion process was no longer allowed. And then what happened was this, they were trying to find a, the materials engineers were trying to find a substitute. And because of the relatively short time frame, there wasn't enough time there to fully test out the long longevity, longevity of that new mixture they had for those wires. And when they were exposed to heat, as we all know now, Hindsight is 2020. Uh, it uh, it broke apart and it broke the wires. We know that. On the old substance, like what you use, what you have in the 560s or in the, you know on the 126s altogether, and then the 123s, 124s, 202s, and those ones, the two yeah was it yeah two two two, they had the old wiring harness and and those wires they last. You will see the crack. And you can see them through, and you can see the couple strands underneath it. But they last 30 years, 33 years, 25 years, and the wires never broke. And that was a direct result. And a lot of the stuff I watched Monkey Wrench Mike the, uh, just a couple days ago, and uh, he was fixing the air pump or the oil pump hydraulic system in his SL he got there I forgot what exactly he calls, he calls it rusty and the fender the internal fender cover plastic is all broken apart and the car is not very old that is a direct result of the changed uh, plasticizers and that started to take effect I would say the, the, the regulations were proposed and enacted in the late 80s and so any car after 95, 96 or so model year is gonna be more and more affected by this. Whether it is the wiring, whether it is uh, uh, plastic parts in general, you know, uh, the entire air duct system for your intake on these newer vehicles, um, they shrink and, and, and they, they're gonna break and they're gonna be brittle and that doesn't take much. Heat is the enemy, and if I understood that correctly, they still have not found a proper replacement for the plasticizer that they had used pretty much from the mid 60s on until uh, the mid 90s. So basically any car which was built between 65, which has plastic in it until 95, is going to have less problems with plastic than anything that goes on after 95. As newer they get and as more environmental restrictions we're going to get, as worse this whole thing is going to get. That is my opinion and, it, and it's a fact. So that's sort of where that came from. Um, so now you have a little bit of an idea. Uh, I don't want to throw these names out. You know, this is really not that relevant. But those, there were a lot of people involved in it. The the main group of engineers at Bosch and SEL together, um, say like this, there, there were two or three brain guys in it, which is their brainchild. This whole thing, the Jetronic in every way, form or shape. Um, they are now retired. They retired probably in the late 90s, the same time around my dad retired. He, my dad is now what, 89 years old or something like this. And so they are, if they're still alive, then um, I think they are, they're going to be at least in their mid to late 80s, all of them. So they retired quite some time ago, but their stretch was from the late 50s where they started working on uh, for Bosch and SEL, and it was that generation which invented this basically and came up with this. And I understand quite a bit of it. Yeah, they, 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 like I said, there would be interesting projects or modifications which one could do, and the upgradability uh, with more reliable and better performing components will stabilize the entire PID loop control you know, situation for these analog DJ tonics. Uh, there's probably quite some improvements you could do. 
they're, they're not easy to tune, but once you get the electronic to run stable, temperature stable especially, and you take the aging component out of this, then uh, you rejuvenate it, not just by resoldering the solder joints, but you have to basically replace every component on there with uh, new stuff, uh, high quality parts, uh, which we definitely have. Uh, you can get some real uh, interesting results out of a 50 year old uh, control unit you know um, you would be surprised I'm not even want to get into the tuning aspect of it and how many possible horsepowers you can get out but just if, if you own one of these old vehicles it, in terms of the electronics involved in it uh, for preservation of it you know might be a good idea or to turn it into a daily dependable driver where you don't have to worry about the electronic feeling uh, that is definitely possible those things are really really possible on the newer units the ECUs is um, that is something I may wanted to point out say like on the K and KE Jacktronic the K Jacktronic of course has a microcontrolled system in there uh, you know that is more prevalent in the uh, idle speed control and emissions control side of it but on the KE Jetronic the KE Jetronic really works hand in hand with the idle speed control unit in the ignition module and uh, on those the primary microcontrollers used in those is Siemens. Siemens was the big alternative. It took Siemens 10 years or so to come up with this 8-bit microcontroller you find in there. That's that little round thing with the spider, looks like a spider web with a plastic thing over it. You have it in the uh, ECUs and you have it in the uh, uh, encapsulated in the uh, ignition system in the EZL and you have it in the uh, idle speed control unit and those things they work but it took them forever to develop it and uh, you know either one of VDO, Bosch or Mercedes could have went to an American semiconductor manufacturer and put an 8088 in there or the Motorola 68HCs they could have put in there but they waited for Siemens, it had to be Siemens, so it took them a lot longer. That's why otherwise they could have had the KE Jetronic already operational by late by the late 70s, early 80s for the first generation 126s. But because they had to wait for Siemens, who started too late with the development of it, and then it took them until like 82, until they had the first working microcontroller out and then so that gave them three years time just for the model change over with the 126 and then the change to the KE and then they had you know all of this had to work together um, these microcontrollers from Siemens they work pretty well and there will be very little however what they did is they put them on these uh, SMD board you know standoffs mounted and they have SMD parts on there and they use capacitors and these capacitors, SMD capacitors, deteriorate even more over time than they do and they can actually stop the microcontroller from working. So uh, that is another area I'm going to start looking a little bit more into to see on how the uh, microcontroller board actually inside the idle speed control unit can be uh, overhauled or you know fixed or preserved let's put it that way so they will operate for a long time to come well i talked for 40 minutes and i hope that the uh, mechanical people uh, didn't get bored and run away and uh, the electronic people hopefully got excited enough of what i had to share with you you know 40 minutes is a long time to look at me and listen to this what i have to say and but i just wanted to share a little bit more background about me of how i do and what i know and where i come from with this stuff 
I was smack dead in the middle of this, what you're enjoying every day when it came to design, development, manufacturing of the stuff. So I, I, I think I understand a couple of things about it. And if you have any questions, if I have the time, I will happily, um, you know, uh, answer the questions you may have. Um, because otherwise I'm pretty busy with everything else I got going. We will see. And if you have a 600 SEL, the say like from 92 on till 96 somewhere, or even 98, anywhere in that range, and uh, you don't have a bombastic price tag on it, you may want to let me know because that would be another one. Black, black on black is preferred. Uh, otherwise, it really doesn't matter. As long as the car still runs, it doesn't matter if the harness has been repaired or not, uh, either one of the harnesses. Uh, or the ECU user working, or the you know the ignition system, or what have you. I I can fix that, believe me. Um, otherwise, I think I would first of all like to thank everyone. And uh, if you like the channel, please like it. And if you want to subscribe, please subscribe. It's your channel. It's it's for you. And let me know if you want to see something, if you want to know something. If, if you think you've got to know my background now a little bit, I may can shed some light into certain areas. I do not know a lot of details about mechanical aspects of the stuff. The mechanical stuff, I have to look in the uh, manual too. But if you want to know why, for instance, the manuals were written the way they are, and why they suggest to use certain tools and this, that, and the other thing is my experience with that part is it is always easier with the right tools and faster than trying to figure out a workaround with the tools we have. Now I understand that uh, money is always an issue in this because these tools are expensive. And believe me, if I can find an alternative, then I will buy the alternative first and hope that I get away with it. And uh, there's probably a lot of tools. Working on cars in general, this is now for the younger viewers here, is a collective experience of years and years of years of haggling around with the stuff. After a while, you know what works better and what doesn't work as well. There's nothing which can substitute experience. And it is always helpful when you work with someone who has experience, who can pass it on to you, because it will make it easier. It is never about being right or wrong. That is not the objective here. This is not an absolute way. There could be a topic, an issue, and there might be 18 different ways to resolve it. How do you get a frozen bolt out, you know, without breaking it? You can research this, and then you can take a look at it, and one of the 18 different solutions is gonna be the right one. The experience will tell one which one to pick out of the 18. That is experience. It's not knowing when it's the question is, which solution to pick at what time for what problem. And that is priceless. You can say, you know, some people say, well, this works better that way. Probably, I, I would doubt it, you know. Well, this could work better on this circuit. There's no question about it. My videos, I'm trying to give you a general idea. And then you can see of what I have posted here on how this may apply to your particular situation or issue or problem or whatever you're working on. And uh, if it doesn't look like it, that it is the right solution, then you may have to look somewhere else. Hopefully you can find it there. Cars are complex. 
as new the cars are today in our technology, with our technologies as more complex they are. It was easier when you had a carburetor, but then also there's 18 different ways to to mess up a carburetor. You know, you can tell someone something and they will still trying to prove you wrong. I'm too old to prove anything. Let's just put it that way. I'm I'm not here to prove nothing, basically. That is, uh, I'm, I'm past that age and, uh, you know, I'm comfortable where I'm at. Let's put it that way. Yeah, let me know your thoughts. I like to read your comments. If I believe that uh, when I come back, don't be surprised. My middle name is inappropriate. I was told this since I was a kid in kindergarten. So I'm used to that. We got tissues for your issues. And uh, if you need a therapist, get one. If you don't have one, get one. Uh, I'm not an easy person to work with, I can tell you that much. Uh, I'm surprised I can work with myself, but that's all right. Well, anyway, I'm just bubbling on here. I think it is time to, to quit the video for tonight. And I'm quite curious to see how many people can last these 47 minutes here and see how many comments we get. You have a wonderful evening. We will have more videos coming and we will see what topics we're gonna tackle there next and then give me some feedback. Let me know what you think about it. Have a good evening.